Hello, Internet. Welcome to week two of my year in a kilt. Uh, got a few things I'm going to go over before I actually get into the content that I want to talk about this week. Just uh, about the, the process and what I was happy about with, or happy with last week and what I wasn't happy with last week and how I've, I've remedied those things uh, because I'm very open when, in terms of processes and things that I'm doing in general. I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, so this week I am wearing the Royal Stuart uh, kilt. This is from uh, William Glenn and Son. The same as the Black Stuart kilt that I wore last week. Uh, it's one of their ca uh, street kilts or casual kilts, polyviscose, eight yard wool or eight yard polyviscose, not wool, uh, for about 160 bucks, something like that. I'm uh, also drinking some scotch this week as I was last week, but I did not mention because um, kilts and scotch go together, and eh, I enjoy kilt or enjoy both. I enjoy scotch. Uh, the particular brand of scotch I'm drinking this week is uh, McClellan's Highland Single Malt. It's about 40, call it 44 bucks or something like that a bottle at uh, the LCBO here in Ontario. I don't know where you find it elsewise in other countries. Uh, it is not the name of the distillery that uh, that makes it. It actually comes from a one of a subset of distilleries. Uh, this particular brand has four or five uh, regional variations of their scotch. Uh, they have a Highland, they have a Speyside, they have a Lowland, uh, they have an Isla. Um, yeah, check them out. They're, they're pretty good, they're affordable. Uh, if you're spending a lot of money for a shot in a bar, I would not advise that. But for a budget scotch uh, with no age statement, it's pretty good. Uh, also, side note before I get too much further in, uh, just because my editing skills suck, and that's part of why I'm doing this, uh, aside from documenting the process too, but I wanted my video editing skills to hopefully get better over time. Uh, I have a dog, uh, Beagle, Beagle Basset Hound Cross named Gemma. Uh, she may bark at, at times. Um, I thought I'd warn you because it can be quite loud. She likes to bark kind of randomly. She's currently hiding under the futon beside me here because she likes being under there. I guess it feels like a den and she feels safe there. Uh, also, before I get into too much more, there were some comments on last week's video and I just looked recently, like 20 minutes ago, and they're not there now. I don't know where they went. I don't know why. I did not delete them. Uh, if Whoever made those comments, uh, and they weren't negative comments by any means. Uh, if you deleted them, that's cool. You know, all the power to you. Uh, if you did not, and I did not, that means the powers that be at YouTube, uh, for some reason, saw fit to delete them, and I'm not sure what's up with that. So, on to, to this week's more housekeeping before we get to the actual topic that I'm going to go through. Uh, I viewed last week's video a couple of times before throwing it up online, and I wasn't overly happy with the way it came out. Uh, nothing to do with the quality. I thought the quality was fine. Just the, uh, uh, I, I thought I was a little bit rambly, and I wasn't as coherent as I usually am uh, when it comes to, I mean, I, I do this for a living. I lecture to groups of students. And I thought about it afterwards, and I figured out, I think, why. And uh, I've taken some steps to, to alleviate those. And I want to be fully transparent in this because when we share knowledge, we grow as people. Uh, so uh, here's my, my reasoning and my thoughts as to why I think this happens. Uh, normally, I lecture to a room full of students, uh, anywhere between 30 and 60 students, depending on the nature of the lecture. And while talking to a camera like this is uh, slightly, it's very similar, it's slightly the same, but it's also, it feels entirely different. Uh, you don't have the communication of ideas. You don't have uh, people asking you for feedback. You don't have people. I'm talking to essentially a camera and the wall behind it. And it's a little weird. Uh, one of those, those methods I, uh, 
have implemented to deal with that is, I mentioned last week, minimizing the, the preview of the camera, and that helped a huge deal. Uh, another one I've layered on is this week is I, I usually, when I'm giving a lecture, I have either slides or I have notes that I'm writing on a board or something, and I didn't have that. Uh, last week I did completely freestyle, and I think that's why I found it a little more difficult than, uh, than I thought it would. Uh, so I went through and I made some, some rough notes of things that I wanted to talk about this week. And this was one of those things that I included in those rough, rough notes. Uh, why am I telling you this? Why am I being open about this? Well, I, for one, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I use open source software and uh, I'm a very open source focused person. And when it comes in terms, or to, in terms of software, we like to think uh, as open source as what open source software means is it's generally free, but not always not. But you can uh, contribute to the source code. The source code is not locked down. It's open. People can submit code to the project in you know, basic terms. And it's worked on by generally more than one person, uh, often distributed around the world. And the, the mentality is that uh, many eyes is better than, than few. Uh, you get more secure, generally, software that way. When there are vulnerabilities, they get patched quickly. Uh, if the community wants to add some sort of feature in and there's a big enough demand for it, those features generally get implemented faster in open source software. But open source to me is more than just that. Uh, it's, it's openness in, in information. It's openness in ideas. It's the ability to collaborate and discuss things and admit when you're wrong, because sometimes we're wrong. But you need to be able to to discuss that. So why why am I doing this? Uh, well, far too often we celebrate or are only celebrated for our successes and not the failures that got us there. And I wouldn't necessarily categorize last week's video, video as a complete and utter failure, but it was not up to the standard of quality that I expect of myself. So we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I'm still new at this whole making a video, throwing it on YouTube thing. I've done one. And you're never an expert on anything the first time. Failure is just practice for success. And depending on what the nature of the thing that you're trying to learn and some sort of natural ability that you have towards that thing, you may require many more failures before you start seeing success. But if you work long enough at it and hard enough at it, you will get there. Uh, so, with all that having been said, Let's actually get into what I want to talk about this week. And I'm going to scroll down to my notes a little bit. Bear with me a second. So, this week's content, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the look that I'm overall going for uh, and uh, where it comes from or where lots of, of discussions on, uh, on Highland dress in general. Uh, which I'm wearing a kilt, so there's some element of Highland dress going on here. Uh, for those unfamiliar with, I am going to use the term traditional Highland dress. Uh, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail as to what that means, uh, but feel free to do some research and I'll, I'll toss some resources if I remember down below. Uh, I'm certainly not fully going for a traditional Highland dress look. I mean, I'm wearing a Slayer shirt, come on. Uh, for classes, I, I tend to wear a polo shirt. It's the only thing that changes. The rest of this is, well, what you see. Um, so yeah, uh, traditional Highland dress. I'm a member of many kilt enthusiast groups on Facebook. And I often see uh, generally kilt wearers are very opinionated and they have certain opinion. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that's bad. But they have uh, certain theories as to uh, this should be worn this way and only this way, and if you do it any other way, it's disrespectful. And there's all kinds of debates and arguments that pop up in these groups that I'm in about, you know, whether you should wear sandals with a kilt or whether you should wear a band shirt with a kilt and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not going to go into what's considered right and what's considered wrong because it's, it's subjective. It's your personal preference. Uh, 
So a, a lot of times you see uh, casual day wear photos and a casual day wear, if you're going by traditional Highland dress standards, is a, uh, a tweed jacket, sometimes a vest, uh, a, a bone handled skiing do, which is the, uh, the dagger in your sock. Uh, skiing do means black knife. And I'll probably mention that again when I get down further. Um, and to me, that doesn't sound very casual at all. Uh, that sounds somewhat dressy by today's standards. Uh, and not so much functional. It's, it's definitely more formal, but in, in the terms of traditional Highland dress, that's not even like the, that's not considered formal per se. It's, it's casual. Uh, many of the traditions that you encounter and styles that you encounter that broadly encompass cr traditional Highland dress have a basis in what was one time or at one time considered practical. And a lot of the, the jacket styles and things like that come out of the Victorian era. Um, I'll give you some examples of these. Uh, some of them come out of, of earlier than that even. They go back a long time. Kilts haven't changed a huge amount in, uh, in hundreds of years. Uh, so some examples. Uh, Gilly brogues, and I didn't think to grab mine, they're down the hall. Uh, Gilly brogues are the, for those of you who don't know, they're the traditional uh, footwear that you see when any, anyone formerly dressed in a kilt is generally wearing uh, Gilly brogues, or they might be wearing buckle brogues, which have a buckle instead of the ties. Uh, Gilly brogues originated from uh, historically having to traverse uh, boggy land regularly. And this is reflected entirely in the nature of the shoe. Uh, they're laced uniquely, for one. They're tied, anyone familiar with Gilly Brogues, and if not, you can look this up, they're tied uh, around the ankle or above the ankle. And that was so if you stepped into some muck in a swamp and pulled your foot out, you wouldn't lose your shoe in the muck in the bottom of the swamp and have to go fishing around for it. Um, there's holes in the, the tops, sort of in the design. And those were allowed or to allow water to drain when you stepped into boggy land. Because uh, the highlands, from what I understand, are very mix of uh, bogs and, and hills and all kinds of stuff. And that's just one example. Uh, great kilts, which I'll be doing a video on, the, on a great kilt later in the year at some point. Uh, but great kilts were considered to be the, the go-to, essentially multi-tool of its time as far as garments. Um, and I'll go into that much more in a later video, but the, the number of different combinations you could do with that piece of fabric, uh, which we still don't fully understand all of, uh, is, are fascinating. Uh, garters and flashes for, for hose, so these are flashes, I don't know if you can see that. Um, they stem from Highlanders tearing off strips of material from, from their kilt just to hold their socks up because uh, these were in the days of pre-elastics. Uh, uh, so that's where that uh, stems from. Uh, the skein do, which is the uh, the traditional dagger that's that's in your sock here. Uh, let's see if I can pull mine out. So there's my very pretty Damascus skein do. Bear with me while I put that away. Um, a skein do stems from a time when uh, you wanted to be armed all the time, uh, which, let's scroll down again. Oops. Uh, you wanted to be armed all the, t all the time, which at, depending on which period in history you're talking about, may or mo may not have been entirely legal. Because um, Highlanders were, were prohibited from carrying weapons at one point, or at several points throughout history. Uh, so it was often, uh, skindu, let's look at the origin of the word first of all. Uh, it's, it's spelled funny, it's S-G-I-A-N-D-U-B-H. It's pronounced skindu. Uh, it's Gaelic for black knife. Uh, and it was a small hidden, or small knife, four inch blade-ish, uh, that was carried somewhere on your person, uh, usually in the folds of your great kilt or hidden in your jacket or something like that. And, and it was hidden. It was uh, a weapon hidden for in the event that you needed it. And it's, knives are multi-purpose uh, multi tools as well. I'm sure there were a multitude of other reasons why you would want a knife on you for cutting string or you know, whatever. 
uh, cutting apples, that sort of thing, but also a weapon when needed. Uh, so yeah, skin do. Uh, when arriving in people you were in a company of people you trusted, it was often taken from its place of concealment and put in the top of your tilt hose like so. Uh, so for two reasons: one, to alert others that hey, I, I I trust you, but I've got a knife and I want you to see that I've got a knife. Um, and B, you know, let them know that I don't perceive you as a threat. It's my knife is there. Uh, it is non-threatening, and there's a there's some debate as to to even more uh, formalities about where and how it was carried. Uh, I have heard, and there doesn't seem to be a historical basis for, of this, but I have heard it from more than one person. Uh, generally, when you wear a skin do, it's in your do the sock of your dominant hand. So I'm right-handed. I put it in my right sock. I have heard people say. Uh, uh, the adage, uh, left for love, right, or right for spite. So you would put it on your dominant hand. If you thought you might have to use it quickly, you'd put it in the sock on your dominant hand, but you still wanted to alert people that you had it. Whereas if you were completely relaxed, you would put it in, uh, in the opposite side to let people know that hey, I really am no threat. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any historical confirmed basis of that. But I've heard it from enough different sources that uh, it's one of those things that anything with any sort of basis in legend probably has a small grain of truth in there. And it's possible. It's possible. But I'm not here to debate that. I thought it was a neat story, and I thought I would share. So, with all that in mind, um, how does this relate for the, the look that I'm going for. Uh, well, I, I do wear army boots that, uh, military parade boots that come up to here ish uh, regularly. I'm not, first of all, I, as a blanket statement, I'm not out to offend anyone by, by wearing a kilt inappropriately. And uh, if you take this pres presentation of my attire uh, offensively, I apologize. But that's not my goal. Uh, I'm certainly uh, in my, my year in a kilt, I'm looking for practicality with a nod to the traditional elements. So I am wearing army boots with, not right now, of course, but uh, army boots with kilt hopes. Uh, when we hit the warmer weather, I will be wearing a kilt with sandals. Uh, no socks, just sandals. That to, to many in the kilting community is seen as like a no-go, you should not do that unless you're going to the beach or near the beach all the time. Well, personally, uh, I hate socks, sandals, and in the warm months I wear pretty much exclusively sandals unless I need boots for one reason or another. You know, I'm cutting grass, I'm going out into the forest or the bush or something like that. Then I'll wear a pair of boots. Uh, they're practical. You can throw them on, you can take them off right away. Uh, I tend to go barefoot at home throughout the, the warm months, and even the winter months, uh, I'm barefoot at home all the time. I, I'm only wearing kilt hose right now because I'm getting in front of a camera. So sandals, practical, makes sense. Army boots, again, practical, makes sense. I wear military parade boots. They're meant for standing around and walking uh, and supporting your, your feet for those sort of things. And they take a shine and they look really nice too. Uh, what am I doing all day? I'm standing around at the front of a classroom and walking around helping students with, with their work. Army boots make sense. Uh, t-shirts with a kilt. Well, I wear t-shirts often. So, and usually band shirts. Makes sense. I'm incorporating the, uh, the garment of a kilt as it is a practical garment from, from based on practical traditions with modern sensibilities. Uh, I have been wearing it with a polo shirt in class because I'm I'm not going to wear a Slayer shirt to class. Uh, I need to look at least a little bit professional, so I dress up a little bit. Collared polo shirt is the way to go. Uh, when it comes to wearing a skiing do, uh, that's often seen as a required for traditional Highland wear. It's one of those things that you have to have. Uh, I wear one when it makes sense. When I'm going out uh, on my own, on, in my personal time, day to day life, totally throwing a skiing do in my sock. Uh, especially because this one is functional. It's got a sharpened blade. It's got a nice edge on it. 
it's nice to have a, a utility knife in your sock, and that's essentially what it is. I'm not looking to go out and shank anyone. Uh, when I'm going to class or when I'm going to a concert, uh, I leave the skein to at home because it makes sense to not bring it into a school environment, uh, ceremonial or not, and it also makes sense not to take it to a concert because it will get confiscated. I'm, I'm not going to be allowed to take that in. So when it makes sense to wear, wear a skein do, awesome. When it doesn't, also awesome. Uh, I'm wearing kill toes with flashes. Uh, partially because, well, the look, I like the look, but also from a practicality standpoint. Uh, it makes sense for warmer uh, coverage, particularly in in the weather that we have in Canada. It gets kind of cold. Uh, and I am wearing a long jacket, which I, I meant to pull out. I'll pull it out next week. Uh, I, I am wearing a, uh, a duster that covers the full length, which doesn't fit with a lot of traditional looks for a kilt because you want to show off the kilt. So kilt jackets are generally cut shorter. Not me. I want to not be cold outside. That's my goal. So I wear the full length jacket as well. And I haven't been cold so far. I have been, uh, actually I find I'm warmer than I am with pants. Uh, mainly I think because there's more material around here than you get with pants. Even in, uh, in polyviscose. Uh, so in summation of all of that, uh, there's, there's lots of people and lots of arguments and disagreements about what's considered proper with a kilt and what's considered to be not proper with a kilt. Uh, I'm not the kilt cops, do as you wish. But some of the best advice that I stumbled across when I first looked into wearing a kilt, uh, as I don't have any family tradition to fall back on, it's not something that was passed down from my parents and their parents and so on and so forth. It was lost somewhere along the way after my ancestors emigrated from, from Scotland. Um, uh, most useful advice, pleats go to the back and length should be to the knee-ish. Uh, the, the old adage for length is above the knee it's a skirt or too much above the knee, uh, below the knee it's dress. So there's, you're looking at about that ish to the knee, somewhere in that, that two or three inches is where the arguments always take place and it's, it's quite silly. Uh, aside from those things, pleats to the back, to the knee on a, a, a male, uh, do as you wish, by all means. Uh, anyone out there who tells you that you're doing it wrong, uh, tell them where to go. Uh, so I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover this week. Uh, I'm going to edit this and get it up shortly. It shouldn't take too long to edit because I'm just cutting off a little at the front and definitely the end. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, enjoy, enjoy some scotch between now and uh, next we meet via the internet. And have a wonderful week.